are, are, are triggered at the time of our past death, which is not more than seven weeks probably before we found our way to our mummy's womb. So at the time of our past death, and we never did talk about death, I was going to, but too late now. Um, that's when all the karmic seeds are triggered that will determine your next life. And that's why in this book, Lama Zopa says, if you're going to help anybody during their life, when they need you most is at death. Now, for the materialist view, this is absurd because they're dead. What the hell? Give them morphine. Get this quick, make it quick, you know, because this poor thing's suffering. But for the Buddhist view, this is when they, you need, they need you badly because this is at that time exactly is when the karmic seeds will be triggered that will determine which life you get. So that's the crucial period to help somebody. And that includes the mouse, your dog, or your grandma. And the crucial thing is to help them be peaceful and virtuous. Because there's logic to this and according to this model. When the mind is peaceful and virtuous, there's a natural relationship between that piece of, that, 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 with the positive karmic seeds. So when you're peaceful and virtuous, the karmic seeds that will be triggered will be virtuous because there's a natural relationship. When you're freaking out at the time of death, which is not uncommon, this can only trigger negative seeds. And that's, that's, that's not good at all. So at the time of death, roughly, these four tracks of these four bank vaults of karmic seeds were triggered. It's just my phrase, obviously. So the first one was a very strong, virtuous seed of non-harming, in particular non-killing. As Lama Zone says, probably practiced in the context of keeping vows of non-killing, which really gives very much potency to our virtuous actions. This one of these was triggered. That already, and we've not even stopped breathing in the past life yet, already was triggered. It's programmed us to go into our present mummy's human womb several weeks later, when she probably hopped into bed with her daddy, unless she were conceived in a petri dish. <laughs> At the same time, the karmic seeds for the next track, which they call actions similar to the cause, but I think we can call them intentions similar to the cause, or your, or your, or your tendencies. So when you look at your own mind, see your tendency to be good at music, tendency to be good at maths, tendency to be very intelligent, tendency to be angry, jealous, lonely, you name it, your entire personality traits, all of these, your own mental tendencies, and they were all triggered simultaneously along with the seed that caused you to go to your mummy's womb. At the same time, the next track of karma, the seeds were triggered for that, and that is that caused you to get born and have all the experiences you have in this world, the people who are kind to you, who are mean to you, who are good to you, the rats in your house, the cockroaches in your house, you know, who shit in your spoon drawer or whatever. They're all the karmic connections. You've got very personal karma with all these sentient beings. This is called experiences similar to the cause. The one of your personality traits is intentions or actions or tendencies similar to the cause. The fourth is your environmental the very way the physical world <coughs> impacts upon you. And that would include, in your case, let's say, like, okay, we'll go through the different things and you'll see, you'll be able to recognize. So obviously, the fully ripened result of any negative action is necessarily the lower realm rebirth, so that's a given for all of them. No need for the big details here. And the, and the tendency to keep doing it, the action, is obviously the, the tendency for each one. So the two that are different in each case is the experience and the environmental. Are we, are we clear here? So the, ten, if you, if the killing karma, obviously the one that's called the intentional, the tendency is you've got to keep killing from past killing, lying from past lying, being loving from past loving. That goes without saying for all of them. And the, the fully right result for all of them is the lower realms, so for the negative ones. So he would discuss one of the what are the experiences similar to the cause of each of these ten? And what is the environmental result of each of these of each of these ten? You with me, people? Are we following? Yes. Silence. I'm not sure if it means yes or no. I'm sorry. So okay, killing. And then we can look at non-killing, just to turn it over. You know. The the tendency so the, clearly the tendency to keep doing it. And and I look at the human realm. So in other words, all the humans on this planet. Can we close the door, please? Thank you. Very kind, thank you. So, the tendency to keep killing, look at this human planet, all these amazing people who won the lottery and got a human birth, isn't it? But the tragedy is, look at the number of humans, it's common to kill. Most religions say it's okay to kill. I was taught by the Catholics that God made the animals and the creatures especially for our sake. They're like a gift from God, you know? I know Jews say the same thing. That's, I mean, that's from the Buddhist point of view, it's quite a different view. 
Huh? It's in the Bible, Genesis. Well, it must be for you guys as well, okay? There you go. So, okay, that's a bit depressing for the Buddhists, because the Buddha says we all want to be happy, we all don't want to suffer, and no one's created us, and we all create our own reality. So it's a very different view, you've got to admit. Mm. <laughs> so then, so then, the tendency to keep killing is obviously the result of having killed in the past. But there's something interesting about that. You know, I gave you the example of a little boy fishing. He went fishing for the first time, and he fell in love with fishing. He spent the rest of his life fishing. Then the other little boy cried it with compassion for the mice. The difference in their cases was this. We can deduce, using Buddha's view, for the little boy who cried with compassion, and he's like 40-something now, and he's never killed anything, we can deduce that he had kept, he had kept strongly vows to not kill. This is the power of vows. That he had vowed to not kill. He lived his life in vowing to not kill. So he practiced it. So he merely just, you see, the, oh, so the other little boy, the fisherman, He'd been, but we've all been in the lower realms in the past, the Buddha would say. And then the little fisherman boy, his karma of killing ran out. He got like a miracle, a human life again. But the tragedy is he'd only finished the fully ripened result, but he'd never vowed to not kill. And one of the residual results left over from the main result of killing is that he has a tendency to kill. Or you have the other one is the experience of being killed. That's the tragedy. Whereas you can see a person who practices a spiritual path, the Buddha would say, who keeps vows of not killing, the main one. One lama said, one, he said, if you want to give one piece of advice from all of Buddha's teachings, don't kill. It's because it's the heaviest harm. And all the, all the others are harmful in variations of that, you know, harming others. So then the vow not to kill is then in this life you will wake up with no thought to kill. When you do hear it, you'll, you'll be able to practice it, which is why any of us maybe have decided to not kill. The imprint is there. So the tendency to keep killing. So the experience, so the two that are different every time, the experience similar to the cause of past killing is you will get killed or you'll die young, basically. So look at this world. Young people die, babies die. Fetuses die. I mean, you're, you're a human from the first second of conception, but you know you're, you, got, you got the human birth. You won the lottery. You got the human birth as the fully ripened result. But due to another lot of karma, the experience from the residual result left over from past killing, you get a human birth due to non-killing, but then you're born in a womb where you're either aborted or miscarry. So your life only lasted a few months. The karma ran out and you die. Babies die get killed or just die. Look at the world. This is due to past killing birth. The environmental result of killing is that the very physical physical world that should nourish us, the water, the food, the air, won't nourish you. You might live in a really polluted place, disgusting food, you might have food allergies, like peanuts will kill you. Or you'll be having an environment like you guys have got. Enemies just down the road, you know? So you'd have a lot of fear. But that's no, that's interesting. That's more sometimes due to You'll, you'll hear different things. But in general, that can be also, you're surrounded by people who are, no, maybe more, no, that's a bit different. Why is, you know, okay, the, the, the environmental result of killing, not just the food and the water, and the, but also you're in an environment, let's say you're living in a war zone where people are dying all the time. That would be one of the results of past killing, environmentally. Keep remembering, no one's running this, this is a natural law. We did it to ourselves. Um, may I have a small question? Yeah. So you said um, someone killed in his past life, result, his karma will arrive, he will die young. One of, the exact, one of the results of killing is to die young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, then, Pardon? and then what? What do you mean by then what? Reincarnation? In what? In what? But that's a different, another, another karma. We're, we're dying all the time. Always getting reincarnated. Never endingly getting reincarnated. The killing. That karma's finished. Every time a fruit, every time, every time a fruit, is this not true with botany? Every time a fruit pop finishes, that's the end of that seed, right? So there's trillions of seeds, and they use the analogy of seeds. Every millisecond of every experience we have, which we label happiness, is the fruit of a virtue. Every millisecond of an experience we have, that's called suffering, is the fruit of a non-virtue. 
So we're as many moments in a day is as many fruits that we're experiencing. And so we can argue that dying young, you know, it's painful for the person, it's due to, it's due to killing. Your, your life runs out, your petrol tank doesn't have enough virtue. That's all. Then you, naturally you get reincarnated again, it never ends. We never do this until we get out of samsara, until we start working on our mind. We'll keep being reborn for eternity. Person. But the killing karma... That's that particular, that particular result of that particular one is finished. But there's plenty more there. Never ending. Until we start changing it. So the next one is, ta is stealing. The Tibetan word for stealing is very direct. Taking the ungiven. You can't mistake it. <laughs> so the, the, the fully... The fully rapid, okay, the experience similar to the cause is sort of obvious. You'll get stolen from. You can't get credit. You're poor. No matter how much you get, you never have enough. You never make ends meet. You always have bad cash flow. That's, you know, that's the result of having stolen in the past. It's sort of, in a sense, psychologically, it makes sense, you know, if you're thinking karma. <coughs> Poverty. I mean, look at the vast majority of the world. They're poor, you know. So it's also not being generous. But this is in particular stealing. You're blocking receiving. When you're st stealing, blocks receiving. You know, it's sort of obvious, <laughs> in a sense. Um, lack of wealth, never make ends meet. And also, like, one of the results of stealing would be, like, everything is just common property. That's like prisons, you know. You have no personal property. Um, the next one, environmental result of stealing, you'd be born in a barren place where crops don't grow or are destroyed or have no power to remove hunger and there's always shortage of food and that kind of thing, you know. Bitter frosts, dry spells stay on too long, it rains too much. I mean, look at all the environments of all the, all the, all the whole universe. Too much rain, not enough rain. Fires, you know, dry. I mean, never all balance of the environment. The environment is the result of the collective karma and the individual karma of all the sentient beings who experience it. These elements out there have no power from their own side. They're our own karmic appearance, the shape and form they take, good, bad, fire, this, earthquakes, you name it. They're not made by a creator. They're not merely physical. They're the direct result of minds. Everything is a fruit of karma. That's put as you. It's a natural law that runs the universe. Sexual misconduct, which sort of means cheating on you. There's two aspects to it in terms of the result, you'll see. But what, what they mean by sexual misconduct is, you know, if you have a relationship and, 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 and a word of honour not to cheat on David, then I break that if I, you know, cheat on him. That's one aspect of sexual misconduct. But the other one is like misusing your body, like to rape people and misusing and you know, to get your own sexual pleasure. It's sort of obvious. Harming others. These are harming others, these actions, the first lot. So it's interesting, the, the experience similar to the cause is related to the, I think, the cheating aspect. And the and, and the environmental result is related more to the kind of the craving aspect, it seems to me, you listen. So the experience similar to the cause of cheating is you'll never, you'll always, you know, people you work with around you are unreliable. You'll always find yourself having a lot of competition for your partner. Your relationships never last. Kind of it makes sense. Yes. The cheating aspect. Environmental. You live in a place where it's filthy and urine and feces and dirt and mud and yuck. Everything stinks and everywhere seems unpleasant and distasteful. That's a very common environment. That can be individual houses. You know, you hear about that. In a beautiful suburb, I remember one time in Connecticut, somewhere in America, this rich husband and wife had someone smelt something and heard dogs crying, and they went into the house, and like 47 dogs, and it was covered in shit. It was like the filthiest house. That's the most bizarre thing you think. Don't they notice the shit? But that's some of the heaviness of, set, of karma is so strong sometimes that you almost can't control it, you know? You hear about people who have filthy houses, like all these people who hoard and they're filthy houses. That's a bunch of... That's sexual misconduct karma. Filthy, smelly, urine, you know, it's very interesting. That's more to do with the, the craving and attachment energy part of it, isn't it? Lying. It's obvious, experience. Guess what? No one will believe your words, <laughs> even if you're speaking the truth. You see, you flip these over and you see the good results. So when I was a little girl, I lied on purpose, and they will believe me. And I even said to myself then, i better be careful with my speech if people believe me when I'm even telling a lie. Remember that. That's the fruit of past truth-telling. That's Mr. Crump's karma. 
<laughs> he's got such good reputation karma that even lately, with the, you know, the latest one, a porn star, she's on the radio, she's been reported in this interview she did, you know, he's cheating on his wife, he says that oh, Africa's a shithole, all these things. It doesn't matter what he does, his reputation is so good that people still love him. It'll run out eventually, you know. <laughs> well, he lies every day. People, all the newspapers are tracking all his lies. No one cares. It's, that's very fascinating. You know, he's like invincible. But that'll run out of victory. You understand? <laughs> lies, the environmental result, your, your work in cooperation with others always fails to prosper. And people don't work well together. Everyone generally is cheating one another and is afraid. And there are many things to be afraid of. Speech has, seems to have this kind of current results, kind of interesting. This is the heaviest one, divisive speech, which means talking bad things about people behind their backs. And we, it's one of our favourite activities, because we feel safe. So we all talk about that evil politician. You come home, you can't wait to talk to hubby about that ugly person at work. We, in Buddhist centres, there's disharmony. Endless, everywhere you go, it's the world. It's unbearable, you know. One time, one Buddhist centre I was part of in the late 70s, early 80s, a huge centre, a very amazing centre in England. And there's this huge schism, this huge division. So painful, it's like a war zone. Lovers over told us that this was the result of, of, of breaking a tantric vow. Vows are very powerful, I'll talk maybe this time. But a, a vow to not criticise what they call your Vajra brothers and sisters. So in the Vajrayana, that means anyone who's taken an initiation from the same lama. It's like family. So he said that, was, that schism in this life was the result of that karma from the past. So I'll say to you as a Buddhist center, you know, individually, if you can promise as a group to never, as much as you can, say bad words about each other behind your backs or about other centers behind your back. Because there's a bit of nervousness, I think, everywhere when new centres are starting. Like Shuggy's got the Shanty Davis Centre now. And people get nervous. Oh, new centres are coming. It's like competition. No, the more the better. You don't have one, what do you call it, synagogue in Israel. Excuse me, you have one on every corner. Be happy, you've got more. The more Buddhist centres, the better. What? We have too many of them. Who's, what? Who's saying that? Who's saying that? What? What do you mean too many? What's wrong with synagogues? People practicing virtue, aren't they? Yes. Mm. Well, then, well, who said there's too many? Who said, I'm just trying to say, oh, oh, that's a, I suppose you don't, if you don't like Judaism, there'd be too many, wouldn't there? No. What? What do you mean there are too many? I'm just curious what you mean, Petal. What are you saying? You don't say anything. Just just that's not because there are too many synagogues, because people are deluded. Yes. Playing the right thing is called bad-mouthing each other. Combined it's a joke. With what? Not, it's combined with political. No, no. I don't care. Excuse me. This is not the issue here. Please keep on track, would you, people? Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't care. It's called delusions of the individuals. Call it politics. Call it this. Call it too many. Whatever. No, the problem is the mind. So, divisive speech, the experience similar to the cause, you'll always be lonely. Interesting. You're always you lose friends easily. That's pretty obvious. People around you're always fighting one another, and, and you'll always have. Or, or people around you have undesirable character. Oh, that's interesting. But also, you know, your relationships. It's like causing divisions and divorces and breakups in groups and families. You know? Environmental result, you know, it's uh, again, it's like broken things, ugly, sharp, no, no lakes, no everything's. Un the environment, you know, is a real mess. So, the, the, we can, so we can do the flip side of not having divisive speech and not having lying. Then you can have a beautiful environment, no killing. The food will be delicious. So you can see that here. Some of the food is very delicious here. That's the result of not killing karma. But, you know, having people in neighbourhoods who are paranoid with fear, that's another kind of karma. So there's these four kinds, environmental, experience, tendency, and fully ripened. There's four, and they can all work together. Abusive speech, you know, being mean to people, shouting and yelling. You'll always be hearing distressing words. That's very common. People are always shouting and rude and arrogant and loud. 
That's prison. They tell me that like all you hear all day is like it's like insane. It's like an insane asylum. It's like in bedlam. It's like being in a rock concert all day. <laughs> Unbelievable. Or you'll get abused by others. Or when even when you're speaking nicely, people will think you're being mean. That's a very interesting one, Pat. From your own past abusive speech, you know. In my medical result, take up the No, for Lover's Oprah, he says, his view is that the karmic result of a environmental karmic result of abusive speech. You live in the desert. Nothing, <laughs> nothing can grow. I mean, you guys have made the desert grow, you know, but nothing can grow. Because <laughs> the environment, I mean, it, it, yeah, just tell me what they say. This needs thinking about. It's kind of interesting. Idle gossip. There you are. Who asked that? Who asked that? The karma of idle gossip. She did. Yes, She's so busy I typing. Know. You did, darling. Okay. So the experience similar to the cause is really obvious that from past life, but even in this life, no one even listens to you. Oh, God, here he goes again. Boring. You have no power of speech. No one listens to you. No one values your words. That seems to be the karma of women. <laughs> Not blaming women. It's just we're all being women and men a thousand times, so don't take it personally. But very common, the karma of, being, of female speech, things are changing. It just has no value. I mean, look at countries, especially in Saudi Arabia, you've got to cover from head to toe. A sound coming out of your mouth is like a rude, a rude, it's like a fart. Who's going to listen to it? Yuck, be quiet, you know. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's heavy duty karma. That you can't even be seen. You've got to probably your vagina sewn up. They do that. I'm not, being, I'm not trying to be sectarian here. I'm sorry. I better be careful. Better edit me, okay? <laughs> I mean, you've got kind of like talk about <coughs> This is the irony of when I first heard the Buddhist teachings, I'd, I'd been first a Catholic, then I became a hippie, then I became a communist, then I was into black politics, then I was a feminist, then I was a radical feminist, then I was a radical lesbian feminist, then I was a radical lesbian separatist feminist. <laughs> and then I heard of them. I was always went to the radical edge of everything I did. So by that point, I really say seriously, I'd have given up, I'd exhausted all options of who to blame on this planet. <laughs> I was exhausted from searching. You know? So finally, I bumped into these Tibetans, and they suggested I should look at my mind. Well, I'd never heard of that before. That was a brand new idea to me. <laughs> That's been keeping me busy for 41 years, you know. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> the point... What? What? I asked not about the speech, but I... Uh, She's not in the middle of telling you my story. You want to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish my story. I won't take long. <laughs> now I've forgotten the point. <laughs> um... What did I say? What did I say? That's what you said. No, no, the one that's speaking. Yeah, right, okay, okay. Look, there I was, a radical lesbian separatist feminist. You can't get a more serious feminist on the planet. <laughs> Serious. I always took my philosophy very seriously, okay? So then I realised, I was sort of shocked, I realised I couldn't keep hating most of the human race. So I started gradually trying to change my mind, and, I, and when I was doing karate at the time, I'd been studying in New York with a bunch of women, I decided in Melbourne I'd go to a man's class. It was a massive shift for my mind, I promise you. And I've been serious, it was a big shift in my mind. I realised I couldn't keep hating everybody, it was ridiculous. So I remember, at that point I broke my foot, a car, a gentleman called Bill Bright, and I'm very grateful to him. He stopped me in my tracks because I was heading off to do karate full time, and he ran over my foot, and I couldn't do karate. And then I saw a poster that said Lama Yeshi. So that's when I went to the teachings. So for me, it was massive shock to hear all these teachings, this arcane stuff, and the boys sat in front of the girls, all this stuff. I'd been this radical political activist, you know. I was really in a state of shock. Mm. So for me, when I began to think about karma, that was something that was huge for my mind from the first months, you know. That really was powerful for me. That piece was missing, karma. So then, it, then I realised, because they always say, check up, and, they, and I like that. So I realised, <coughs> if Buddhism were innately patriarchal, in its bones, you know, the teachings, of course I couldn't stay. That's insanity. It's not possible. So I knew I had to really think it through really seriously, of course, at your own pace, that's all you're doing. So I remember realising, dawned on me, if reincarnation is true and if karma is true, then what's so exciting about being a, you know, don't get so caught up in being a girl, it's true, I'm a girl now, I've got to fight for girls' rights, that's my job, 
but I've been, why am I in this position? Why, if I'm bored, is that something with my head closed, my things is, and sewn up, and whatever, no words, meaningless, guess what? Who Guess who's born like that? The arrogant boys. So it's like anyone on your face, you know? Are we communicating here? <laughs> then I was quiet. I thought, okay, shut up, Rabina, stop complaining. You, know? you did it to yourself, girl. <laughs> That's the trouble. The rapist becomes the little girl who gets raped. I know it's shocking to us, but you've got to say it and be brave, you know, if reincarnation is what you're looking at as a proposition for a view of the universe. You can't just say, oh, I don't want that, you know. The Jews must have been really mean to the Nazis in whatever thousand lives ago that you were called something else. But also, you see, good karma is the same, but you remember that. Everything that good has happened is the fruit of having done it before. That should encourage us, you know. So anyway, having talk that no one listens to, due to rabbiting on about nothing in a past life, that's all, all that came. So what was your question? In the, in the thought, uh, because everything, right? Does, what body, you want? does body speech? We're discussing here only body and speech. Uh, okay. Not yet mind. So then, the next one. Uh, oh, my computer's got. Um, iPad has a mental breakdown every now and again. I'm going to get a new one. Look, it goes big and small and shakes. Any IT people here? Any IT people here know about iPad behavior? I think they'll work it out. Okay, the next one. So they're the seven of body and speech. Yeah. What's the text that you're reading from? This, okay, this is a teaching that I put in a book that I put out, a PDF of many different teachings. I'm very happy to send it to Shaha or somebody and you can get it. It's got lots of teachings in it. It's a book that I put together from different teachings. What about the vows and the... This that I'm reading now is a teaching I put together from different people that I put in a PDF that when people want a book of teachings, I send them. On karma? On karma? In your book that you've got right here that the Dharma Friends of Israel kindly published, there is a teaching on karma. Every word I've said in this room and more is in this book. This piece here that I'm reading you is not in this book. But I have it in a PDF and I can send it to you Thank if you, you want it. Yes. So I, I've got a book that's got about 300 pages of teachings oh. on all the Lamrim of His Holiness, some of my stuff, Lama Zogu Lama Yeshi. I can send that to whoever you want. And it includes some of this and you can, it's all in there, okay? So if you want it, who will I send it to? I'll send it to Shaha and you, he can send it to whoever wants it. Put it on your website, do what you like with it. Okay. It's got all the it's got all the teachings in it. I'll just you know, I'll show you. It's got like okay. You know, the first is an overview of the entire path, A to Z. Then the next part is all about the mind, the pure nature of mind. What is the mind? What is meditation? Preparing for meditation. The next one is all about how to think about death, what happens at death, refuge, how karma plays out, ten non-virtues, this one, how to purify karma, about the mind, be our own therapist, then body teacher, then emptiness. Okay, all of the teachings, a whole bunch. It's a, collection. it's a collection of teachings in one book, A5 book, as a PDF. I'm very happy to send it to you. Okay, good. And then, then also by Lama Yeshi, the psychology of Tantra. Okay. Tantra. Okay, I can send it all to you. What's your question? Yeah, yeah, it's time to go. Uh, still about karma. Yes, darling, what's your question? What is the importance of, let's say something bad has happened to me, and it's a karma ripening? Yeah. What is the importance of uh, understanding the specific cause of that event? I don't believe you ask these questions, you marvelous, intelligent people. I'm so shocked and speechless and shocked and speechless that you should ask that question. So let's use the garden as an example. I'm sorry, I know I'm rude, Yale, but I'm not trying to be. So we use ordinary example. Say the question again. Say it carefully. What is the importance uh -huh. of understanding the specific Cause okay. of an event. Okay, good. Thank you very much. If you go to your doctor and you say I've got a bad chest, what is the advantage of her identifying the cause of it? Say it. Speak uh, it out. She can uh, uh, find the right cure. Thank you very much. Is this not kind of obvious? Surely if you have a problem, you have to first identify the problem. That implies the solution. But if uh, the event already occurred... Sweetheart, 
it is telling you to stop killing if you've got to keep getting... Uh, okay, if you have the experience of people not... If you have the experience of people not believing your words. You go, why is that? Because I'm telling the truth. And then you go, well, Buddha says I must have lied in the past. So what's the solution? Stop. To stop having it happen in the future. Thank you.